Okay, welcome everyone. This is the Premier Chess Adult Beginner, uh, April uh, spring spring class, uh, spring 2021, and this is week five, and we're going to be continuing our discussion of of planning on a grand scale and analyzing a um, a master game from history and seeing how these top players think and plan. So. I have a, I have a game here, um, uh, Tigran Petrosian versus Unziker, nineteen sixty in Hamburg, and um, so so who is uh, Tigran Petrosian? First of all, anybody know? Was a world champion, I think. Yeah, yeah, he was a previous world champion. Anybody know? Uh, what he was famous for, like like his uh, you know, his style of playing. Anybody have an idea? It was more defensive. Yes, definitely more defensive. Yeah. So let me just um, I just go into uh, Wikipedia really quick just to read a little bit about him. So his nickname was Iron Iron Tigran, right here. That's a picture of him. Iron Tigran, due to his almost impenetrable defensive playing style, which emphasized safety above all else. Um, he was world champion 1963 to 1969. And um, yeah, he was in stark contrast to <clears throat> very much attacking players like Bobby Fischer and even more uh, extreme attackers like Mikhail Tal. Uh, so he was very... Uh, very successful in his, and, and, and I think it's just interesting. It, it, it points out how, you know, to be good at chess, um, you know, you can have a, a variety of different styles and still be effective, right? So it's not just one style is effective, you know? So he emphasized defense and consolidating your position and making slow improvements, you know, slowly gaining space. Uh, you're not going to see when you study his games, you're not going to see, brilliant sacrifices like you know brilliant unclear uh usually sacrifices as tal would often do mainly like for the shock factor <laughs> to like shake up his opponents you won't see that from tigran i mean if it's like if it's a sacrifice it's a calculated one and uh and if, if that if that's the case it's not really a sacrifice he's doing it for a good reason so so yeah so that's uh that's tigran petrosian and i think I, i'm my style is very much influenced by by that that um style as well i think i'm very much like i think another way people describe him is like a like a boa constrictor snake you know that <laughs> that that um that kills its prey not by violence in the sense of like like you know attacking or venom or anything but it's slow constricting right and it's not even constricting constantly it's only constricting when the prey inhales so so there, even this, even the boa constrictor is utilizing, is economizing its energy. It's not constantly squeezing, but only when the prey inhales and squeeze a little more, right? Then exhales and inhales, squeeze a little more. So it's really um, <clears throat> expending energy when it's most efficient, right? And that's kind of how I see his style is, is he 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 see, he seeks uh, you know minor weaknesses in his opponent's position and just focuses on that until they become major weaknesses right so that's his style so let's see how this game went on so he is uh white here so we have d4 knight f6 knight f3 e6 so this is a very ge generic opening like this could transpose into a lot of things bishop f4 would be maybe the london or c4 would be queen's gambit decline maybe and then black would play something like this d uh d5 that could so it could transpose into a couple of things um, so let's see what happens. Bishop G5. Okay, so this is a different line. So I forget the name of this opening. Um, I want to say the Trompowski attack, maybe. Is anybody familiar with this opening? Yeah. No. Uh, so yeah, so just uh, you know, early pinning of the knight. Okay. D5, C4. So again, so th this I think this is the Queen's Gambit decline setup. I think it's a Trompowski attack. I'm, I think I'm pretty sure. Um, so immediately putting pressure on the knight. Uh, which is um, which is protecting the pawn on d5. Uh, so yeah, all right, c6. So so um, solidifying protection of the of the central pawn. Okay, very good. Queen c2. Okay, so maybe 
Queen C2 perhaps um, maybe he wants to prepare castling queen side, or maybe he wants to eventually bring the rook onto C1 and exert pressure this way, and then and then do a uh, a minority attack with two pawns, trying to break open lines. So it could be a few things. Also, could be maybe he wants to prepare E4. So he's focusing on E4, knight BD2, and then pushing E4 that way. So could be a few reasons. Bishop E7, so he breaks the pin. E3, castle, knight C3. Okay, just standard good developing moves. H6, bishop F4. Okay, so so yeah, so this is interesting, right? So, so he... Basically, he just wanted to provoke, you know, the h6 move, and then uh, the bishop comes back to f4, right? So, so I wouldn't necessarily call it a wasting move, it's just like, um, it's just causing a little bit of a nuisance and irritation, and then and then hopefully provoking that. And, and maybe he wants to provoke that because he wants to do a, a minority attack and blow open the lines on the king side that way. Maybe he wants to do that, so we'll see. Okay, takes. Takes. Okay, so so now here's the first uh, interesting um, the first interesting spot in the game. So so when I look at if I'm black, right, and, and my opponent just took here, so my initial response would always be to take with uh, with the e pawn. Now that's um, one main reason is because I hate. Um, I detest uh, symmetrical positions. <laughs> so this this uh, this position is a lot better, and uh, to me, it just yields better games. And and uh, you know, um, so black has the open half open e file to work with. White has the half open c file to work with. Um, so it just seems like a much better decision to me. To me, I, I mean, and also another reason why c takes d five. Actually, the computer gives it as a uh, as a mistake is because already the queen is on the C file and the bishop is controlling this entire diagonal. So you can kind of say that black just gave white the entire C file, right? So he already just surrendered the C file. So that's no good. So probably why that's why they gave it a, uh, a question mark. Okay, so let's continue. Bishop D3, A6, castle. Okay. All right. So, so here, yeah, here the recommendation is that this knight is kind of not in a good spot. So maybe a better move would be to reroute the knight uh, to um, to c6, and then perhaps eventually, um, eventually uh, a5, and then maybe after after b5 coming to c4, right, having a nice outpost there. So, so yeah, this knight um, in this situation not too happy. All right, so b5, so a4, okay, so so immediately challenging this and provoke. It's kind of like now black, like white is just asking black to play b4, you know, this is just provoking it. So black obliges, b4, knight a2. Now here's another interesting knight maneuver. Uh, so remember, you remember last game we did with Nimzovich, we saw the interesting knight maneuver, right? So knight a2. Is another very interesting knight maneuver. So he sees this square on b3 as a very good out, as a very good square for the for the knight to be on, right? Because if you went, I mean, I guess you could go, you could go knight b1 and d2 and b3 that way. You can do that. Um, knight knight d1 would be no good because then it's completely trapped and blocked by all of the pieces. So that would be useless. Uh, knight e2 doesn't really accomplish much. You don't really want to go on the king side. Um, because there's just too many pieces already, and and this bishop is kind of kind of trapped. Can't really retreat if the knight's blocking it. So, so yeah. So this is kind of a nice maneuver. Um, so knight a2, c1, b3. All right. So that's kind of nice. Knight e8, knight c1, and knight b3. Yeah. So yeah. And, and now, of course, now this knight is ready to jump on uh, here, c5, and then. So, so, so look at, just take a look at this position. First of all, like already, like, like no obvious mistakes were made, but already you can say white has an advantage, right? White is completely controlling the C file. So it's kind of interesting with his, um, with his style. Uh, you can, you can kind of describe his style as, um, as like, you know, you didn't make a mistake, but all of a sudden you find yourself in a losing position. <laughs> it's like, how am I in a losing position? I didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> so already, 
um black is having some trouble here right so kind of interesting all right so so on, and obviously so you so say yeah um uh white definitely has more scope like, look at the bishops right nice scope look at this bishop nice scope right this the black bishop does have scope the white bishop not so much right it can only move to these two squares and completely blocked over here so what is the strategy um if you are cramped what is the best strategy what do you what do you think what should your goal be trade some pieces right trade some pieces alleviates your your <laughs> lack of space right so so black sees that he's having trouble with his bishop activating it uh because he's already blocked by these light square pawns so he's going to try to trade it with bishop a6 so bishop a6 bishop takes takes okay so now queen d3 uh hitting the rook again uh rook a7 so now now we have some obvious moves right so so you know we have a open file we don't want black to take control right so so bring the rook quickly onto the onto the c file um knight d6 okay um so we'll, let me ask you guys in this position um what would you do if you were white in this position? What do you think is a good move here? So Black's last move was knight uh, d6. And Danilo, before you get an answer to that, why did he move his his uh, f rook instead of his a rook? Um, I mean, I guess in this case it doesn't really matter because I think eventually they're gonna they're gonna be doubled anyway. So yeah, it doesn't really matter. Uh, there's no other open file, right, for the other rook to occupy. So, so yeah, I think they're both going to focus on the C file. Um, all right, so knight d6. So what do you think? Um, best move for for white. And, and I'm not necessarily saying that because there's some kind of great uh, tactic. You know, it's just that, uh, you know, given this position, what do you think this position calls for? Maybe knight e5. Knight e5. Let's see. Uh, so he didn't play that, but okay, that's interesting. So you're you're threatening a fork here. Um, so he's probably he would want to take, take and then take, and now maybe he can jump onto uh, knight c4, and that's kind of an annoying move because now he's threatening to win a pawn. And he's threatening to capture the bishop. And uh, you know how top players always uh, jealously guard their bishop and don't want to give it up for a knight. So, hmm. so yeah, uh, probably not for that reason. So what else? How about lifting the C rook? To where? C two. C two. Okay, so simple uh, doubling of the rooks. Uh, okay, not bad. Um, let's see. So if he goes, if he went rook C two, you know what can he do? Maybe he goes knight C four because he wants to block these rooks, right? So, and then maybe uh, white's like, I want to trade. And black says no, <laughs> and. Uh, and now it looks like black has successfully clogged up the um, the C file, right? So he's neutralized the threat or, or the threat of invasion by white, right? So we need something a little bit stronger than that. What do you think? Rook C6. Okay, so rook c6 is a good move. Um, you're hitting the, the knight twice, that's true. Um, I think it's a little bit risky, though, because the rook uh, is kind of out there and now easy to get trapped, 
right? So now your rook is out there by himself. <laughs> He's feeling a little bit lonely, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's a possibility, there's a definite possibility that he can get trapped there. So, so yeah, so we don't want that to happen. So what else? It's a good idea, though. To, that, that's a good idea, though, to, to do the rook lift, to prepare the doubling of the rooks and move it with tempo. This is, so you're doing it with a gain of tempo. Problem is you're risking your rook getting trapped, right? So, so then what, what do you think? Sorry, my fault. <laughs> Where was it? Uh, okay, sorry about that. Go ahead. You bring the F knight to D two. F knight to d2. Why why do you want to do that? So then he can't move his d knight to Yeah, exactly. So this knight is threatening to um to block everything, right? And congest the whole C file. And so probably that's probably a good idea. Um so you're close and uh, and Leonard was close with this one. So what Petrosian did was he did something that's very counter um to, you know, what uh what most chess players would want to do, which is you see this bishop. This bishop is nicely placed, right? This diagonal is very beautiful, and it's outside of the pawn chain. It's a good bishop, and you know how most most um, top level players love their bishops. So of course he traded his good bishop. <laughs> I'm sure that was a very painful decision for him to do, because uh, you know bishops are so powerful, and that was a really good bishop. But he thought it was necessary. Um, because now after bishop takes, now we go uh, rook c6. And again, preparing to, to double up and gain of tempo. So what do you think um, is a good move for, for uh, black? What do you think? I would think knight to b8 because it threatens the rook and protects the bishop. Yeah, yeah, good move. Yeah, so that's what he did. Knight b8. Yeah, very good. So uh, discovering a, a defense of the bishop and at the same time attacking the rook, forcing it to, um, forcing it to uh, retreat. So this is a, another good thing that I always say that uh, you see in master games is that they every move they make, they try to make multi-purpose, right? They try to accomplish multiple goals with each move, right? So this bishop is being attacked. Now, maybe most beginners would say, okay, my bishop is being attacked. I'm going to retreat it, <laughs> right? But if you do that, now you're allowing white to, do, white to set up this, uh, this uh, double rooks and you're not, you're not challenging him at all, right? So why not protect the bishop and attack at the same time simultaneously, right? Defend and attack, right? Very good. Uh, very good use of time, right? So don't waste any time, you know, um, you know, giving your opponent easy, um, you know, improving their position easily. You know, don't let them do that. So knight b8, good move for that reason. So he goes back to c2, uh, and then uh, knight d7 again. So he's basically saying to Petrosian, if you want to, if you want to repeat the position, I'm happy to do so. If you come back to c6, <laughs> so. But Joseph says, no, actually, you know what? This is actually, okay. So we actually, this is very interesting. So, so in this position, we're with this knight on D seven, our rook is now on C two, right? So let's go back a couple of moves. So same, same position in the board difference is rook is on C one, right? So by doing this, by doing this little uh, combination, he took the knight and the bishop takes now the rook uh, and now the bishop is unprotected, right? So rook C six, knight B eight, rook C two. So knight b6, knight b7, the same position is reached. And now you can say the white gained a move, 
right? Because now he's out, he has his, his rook on c2. Now he's ready to to double up. So that's pretty clever use of uh, of move like that. <laughs> I like that. All right, so rook a to c1. So that's like a very subtle. That's like a very subtle way of of gaining an advantage. You know, you repeat the position, but slight difference. You know. Um, and, and you slowly make uh, improvements in your position that way. Okay, knight b6, attacking the pawn on a4. He defends queen b5. Uh, okay, so now he blocks, of course, knight c4. Uh, and now uh, white tries to dislodge the knight. Takes, takes. Okay. And then queen over. Rook d to c2. Um Rook to d8, uh, rook c6. So now, now Petrosian has successfully invaded. So now look at look at the position. Like, like just compare the two, the two, um, the two positions, white and black. Like, who do you think is the attacker and who is the defender? Right? It's pretty obvious, <laughs> right? Who is on the defense and who is really uh, has a much more powerful position, right? So the queen, the rook has just invaded the sixth rank. This queen is all the way in the back rank. And, th and this rook and queen are here defending this lowly pawn here. And, you know, white is very imposing, right? The queen position, very good. Doubled rooks in the C file. White completely dominating the C file. So all these, you know, again, all these little um, advantages slowly, they end up to accumulating to become a big advantage, right? So again, there was no point where black made an obvious mistake and yet he's almost in a losing position. <laughs> Don't you love when that happens? <laughs> he's almost in a losing position. It's pretty amazing how that happens in, in top level games like this. So rook c6, um, g6. And actually that, that also brings to mind uh, something that, um, that Evan, Evan said, says often, which is what's the difference between a master and a beginner, right? And, uh, and, and, you know, you know, like even if a beginner plays the game and they don't make obvious mistakes, you know, they still end up losing. Why do they lose? Right. Because the master just makes more precise mo moves, you know, you know, both players didn't make any mistakes, just the master made more precise. Right. So it's about, it's a matter of being precise and accurate with your moves. Right. So G6, uh, maybe providing some space for the king. G3, taking a moment to um, eliminate back rank threat. King G7. So yeah, black really can do nothing <laughs> at this point. Like white is completely dominating. So, so now the question with white is how do I um, convert this to a win, right? So having a having an advantage and then turning that into a win is are two different things, right? So that's that's the key. That's the problem sometimes that a lot some beginners have. They're like, all right, I'm winning, but now what do I do? <laughs> right? You got to turn it into a win. So King G7, King F1. Now, interesting move. Why do you think he did king f1? Why did he do king f1? Anybody have an idea? Because the black queen is poised on the white diagonal. The black queen. Oh, oh, this one. Um, I don't think because of that, but that's a that's a good observation because because Petrosian would never want to open up this diagonal exactly for that reason. But I think there's another reason why he played king f1. Can anybody figure it out? Why did he do that? Does he want to help bring the pawns up for a pawn storm with the king? Um, okay, maybe, maybe. Uh, I think he does want to do a pawn storm, but um, in this position, so so Petrosian looks at his position and says, "Okay, my rooks are pretty nicely placed. My queen's very imposing and nicely placed, and the knight is, is putting pressure on this weak a five pawn. So all my pieces are pretty good. Um, now, what he wants to do." here is say well you know what maybe i want to do a pawn storm on on the um on the black king but i don't want to keep my king here so how about this how about i take a little king walk and go to the queen side <laughs> so he does he transfers his king like, like you could say black is almost in the state of zug he can't really do anything so he goes for a king walk <laughs> in a little stroll in the park so now h4 take a moment to okay fix the pawn position and now rook c rook one c two okay king g seven so black can't do anything. Now he continues his stroll in the park king e one 
King GA, King D1. <laughs> it's kind of funny that <laughs> your opponent is tied up. So why why rush things, right? Take your time and just slowly improve your position. Um, no need to rush and overextend yourself, right? So black can do nothing. King H7, King C1. So he eventually ends up on B1 and he's happy. <laughs> now the king is safe on B1. So now he can go about improving his position in other ways now. So now he goes queen e2. Now his business is to open up this uh, this pawn defense around the king, right? So now he's going to try to try to uh, open up some lines, right? So queen e2, queen b7, rook c1, king g7, queen b5, okay. Queen a8, f4, king h7. Queen e2. So you can see Pachoja is not, he's not rushing at all in any way. Queen b7. And now what, what would you do here? What do you think would be a good move here for white? How does white break through here? Go knight d4. Okay, so I heard knight. Okay, uh, knight where? What did you say, Tony? Knight d2. Okay, so knight d2 headed for where? You want to get it to g5 so you can get the last five. Oh. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, you are targeting here, but you can't really put additional pressure there. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, I heard Leonard say g4. Yeah, that's the move that he played. Yeah, so queen e2 preparing for g4. Um, yeah, very nice move opening up the king side. And um, yeah, there's not much that black can do to avoid that. So so he takes, h takes, queen takes. So now the king side is slowly going to open up and white will uh, invade that. Now you can see how important it was to move the king from here to here, right? <laughs> you don't want your king there when the G file is opening up. So you don't want, and the H file most likely. So you don't want that. So yeah, this is very, very wise. And uh, uh, how do you say, he's, a, he's very, um, what do you call it? Looking to the future. Um, I forget though what that word is. Um, anyway, queen takes G4, queen E7. Um, h5 continuing to open up lines uh queen f6 so now he 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 takes a moment even to uh <laughs> to to protect his king even further <laughs> on a2 he doesn't want he doesn't want to any allow any um any any uh queen uh queen f5 check trading queens or if he takes if he takes on g6 with check uh, queen can take back, and now that's going to force a trade of queen, so he doesn't want that. So he moves the king out of the way. Um, king g7, and then h takes, queen takes. So now what do you think? Do you think you think Petrosian traded queens here? What do you think? I think he moved the rook to the g file. Um... Okay, so if you move the rook to the G file, he's Black would love to trade queens because now that makes his defending uh, his defense much easier, right? Now this king is actually now this king is actually more of a threat, right? Because remember now we're almost in the end game, and now this king can invade easily uh, the um, the white position. Now this king becomes pretty dangerous, actually. So, so yeah, you don't want to trade queens, definitely not. So, so he definitely did not trade queens. Queen h4, he sidestepped that, uh, attacked the rook. Okay, um, black went back, bishop e7, 
queen f2. Okay. So now what is uh what is queen f2 threatening? Rook to g1. Yeah, rook g1. Yeah, winning the queen, right? So so black has to retreat the king, king f8, um knight d2, rook b7. Again, we went back to b3, rook a7. Okay, queen h2. All right. Bishop f6. So eliminating this annoying check. Rook c8. All right. So now now he's trying to now he's trying to get in on the on the back rank. Maybe take here. Take here and uh, um, invade on the back rank. Rook c8 through through rook c8. We have rook d7. Okay, so now for um for white, how would you proceed here? What's the best? What do you think the best move for white is? What would you play? I mean, you could take the free pawn on the A file. Uh, you can take the pawn. Um, probably, I mean, I mean, I guess you, it, it would eventually be winning, but there's a much stronger move and, uh, this is not really, uh, this is not really, um, a, uh, an attack or a strategy to win pawns this is an attack on the King. This is an assault on the King, right? So, so yeah, I think taking knight the pawn would be a little bit too tame. Okay. So knight C5. Yeah. So, so now we have rook D7, um, defending the rook, right? And so knight c5 is an excellent move uh, attacking the, the rook. If, of course, if, we, if he takes our rook, we take with check, right? And then uh, we win back the other rook, right? So very nice move, rook c5. Uh, so out of desperation, black plays uh, b3 check. King takes b3. And then he moves up rook uh, d6. Now, uh, white to move. What would you play here? White to move. Uh, F5. Yeah, F5. Very nice. Opening up the, the queen, uh, hitting the rook, which is, which is not protected due to this rook being pinned, right? And simultaneously attacking the queen at the same time, right? So very nice, very nice discovered attack there. So F5. So this queen is in a very good location right here on this on this dark square diagonal. So F5. Um, and then rook went to B6 uh, for a quick check. King A2. And here, um, black resigned. <laughs> Black resigned. So, um, yeah. So, like, like, what, what, what is he gonna do? You know, he, his, uh, his, um, his queen is being attacked, and also black is threatening take, take, knight d7, fork. <laughs> right. So, not much he can do here to uh, meet all those threats. Right. Something is gonna be lost. Something big. Right. So. Yeah, I th I think um this is a very nice illustration of a of an attack that is just, you know, resulting from the slow accumulation of small advantages, right? And then and then uh there's a quote I believe by Bobby Fisher that says um tactics flow out of a superior position, right? So, you know, the important thing are the basic principles, right? Of what we always talk about, right? Centralize your pieces, develop castle and uh, get your pieces to active locations, right? So that's the important thing, right? And then the tactics, they just come, they just flow out of that. So if your opponent is violating any of those principles, um, you know, there will inevitably arise tactics where you can punish uh, your opponent from violating those principles. So and I think it's a good, good illustration of that. Um, so, yeah. What do you think? Anybody, any uh, questions? You want me to go over something again? What do you think of this game? Any uh, observations? Uh, 
is it uh is it clear like uh like it, it like do you think his moves make sense to you yeah yeah like like you know when you when i explain it like you can understand his thought process right why he's doing these moves and and um you know it's not um you know they're they're not wild fanciful moves they're logical straightforward moves <laughs> And then, and then just by doing that, he uh, easily defeats a top-level chess player, right? Um, and uh, he makes it look easy, right? <laughs> he makes it look easy. <laughs> so that's it. That's another thing you know uh, when, when you're dealing with a top player. You know they they make beating these these really high-level players look easy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that's the game. Um, so we can go over. Um, do you want to go over anything else from this game, or do you want me to? Uh, I, I mean, we have like twenty minutes. I can go over another game, uh, like some smaller games, if you want. We'll do some. I got some yeah. mini, some miniatures. I can show you. Like those are always cool. Uh, let me look at miniatures. Any uh, any comments about that game? I'm just curious what you guys thought of it. I thought you know it was a lot of his moves were like nothing. Um, spectacular but yet little by little he maneuvered his pieces to right just where he needed them right exactly yeah yeah he uh yeah very logical very straightforward moves and um and the result seemed to be inevitable right it's pretty amazing um and that's that's kind of how I, I i try to play my games you know i try to be very logical very slow and methodical and systematic you know i guess not not very exciting for people to watch, you know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, a win is a win, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, you do, you do what you have to do to win. That's, that's, that's what chess is about. <clears throat> um, all right. So now these games uh, that I'm going to show you now are not uh, slow and methodical and systematic. They are quick and exciting and violent. <laughs> so big difference <laughs> from what we just saw. So um, these are all uh, a collection of miniatures. Um, so the first one is Traxler versus Samanek, 1900 in Asiki. So we're going to see how this went on. So, oh, but first of all, what is a miniature, by the way? What is a miniature? 20 or less. Yeah, 20, 20 or less. Sometimes some, some sources say 30 or less. But yeah, usually 20 uh, moves or less. Sometimes even 10 moves or less, right? So very quick little games, right? And usually very... Um, very wild, brilliant sacrifices and pretty violent. So a lot of blood on the board. All right. So <laughs> E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight F6. Okay. W what opening is this? Anybody know? Is it Petrov? Yep. Petrov's defense. Yeah. So so white, you know, very natural move. Knight F3 attacking the uh, E5 pawn which is not protected. And so other moves could be like knight, um, knight c6 is a common move or maybe uh, d6 protecting the pawn. But knight, F3, knight f6 is also considered um, an okay uh, response. So it's a counterattack, right? So you attack the pawn on e5, knight f6 counterattacks the other pawn on e4. Now, let me ask you guys a quick question. So um, if uh, th this was not in the game, this is just this is a side thing. If if white took the pawn, what do you think the best move here would be for black? I know it's not to take the pawn because I got burned at this week. <laughs> started out in the chess club. Yes. And I hated this opening after that. Yes, I, exactly. I think, I think you could get away with a pawn, but and, but and I, the re and the reason uh, the reason that taking the pawn does not work why because this is actually um, one reason why the copycat strategy always fails right it always benefits white right because white has the extra half move right so it is not prudent to do the copycat method yeah. and we're gonna see why right queen e2 attacks the uh, attacks a knight and um, and if the knight retreats then what's white's best move here oh sorry black retreats what's white's best move here I remember this because it happened to me. You put the knight on c6, and See, it's pretty that, much game over. That's the best way to. That's the best way you can learn, right? When it happens to you, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you never forget it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, here this sets up a very nasty discovery. So knight c6 attacks the queen, and the queen will be lost. Cannot 
uh, you can't save the queen here. So very, um, yeah, a little trick that with the Petrov's defense. So if you're gonna if you're gonna do this as black, do not copy your opponent. Right. <laughs> Better is uh, d6. Right. Scare away the knight first. Knight comes back. Now you can take the pawn. Now if he tries to pin, now you just block the uh, unpin with the queen and and everything's good. Game goes on. Right. So now there's no uh, loss of the queen. So yeah, a little thing about the Petros defense. All right, so knight c3 in this game, he went uh, knight c6. So yeah, so we can see that black, talking about the copycat strategy, <laughs> this is what black is doing. <laughs> and we're going to see why this fails, right? Uh, I, I think uh, I think I told you guys, uh, um, uh, Greg and Monty, uh, you guys have been with me. You, I think you heard this story that my kids are 10 and 8, and... Um, I always hear like when they're playing, I have them play each other like almost every day as much as possible. And and if 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 they're playing a regular game like this, regular setup, and they're copying, then I inevitably hear it. He's copying me, Daddy. <laughs> Tell him to stop. <laughs> and but it's just funny because because the white, it's always the person who's white who's complaining, but it always benefits white, <laughs> the copycat strategy, but still they don't like it. So the way I avoid that is. I have my kids play nine chess 960 and I have I have each of their positions be different. So they each have different opening setups. So that way I avoid <laughs> that altogether. <laughs> and I never hear about it. <laughs> so that's my way. So okay, let's continue. So castle castle. Um let's see. All right. D3, D6. Okay, continuing to copy, take, take. <laughs> See, this is, this is taking the copycat strategy to the max. Bishop wow. takes, bishop takes. <laughs> See, but by this point, I would hear one of my kids crying if, if they were, if they were doing this. Copy. <laughs> Bishop takes, so complete, uh, still copying. Bishop G5, bishop G4. Queen takes A1, queen takes A8, still copying. So we're on move 11. So still copying. Bishop takes. Bishop takes. Um, <laughs> and now, uh, okay. Now in this position, uh, as white, what would you play as white here? What do you think? So here's where white begins to punish black for his uh, bad decision of copying him. <laughs> what do you think? Any idea? I want to say Bishop G seven. Okay, so if we go, if we go Bishop G seven, um, let's see, can he still copy him? Yeah. Take. And what if he takes here? You can take. <laughs> so the copying will continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the copying will continue. So there's a better move than Bishop takes G seven, which is what. How about queen c3? Uh, queen c3. Let's see here. Um, all right. <clears throat> hmm. Hmm. All right. Interesting. Uh, possibility. 
Maybe he does something like this. It's a possibility. That's not what he played, but okay. Anybody else? What else? So you want, uh, I'll give you a hint. So he wants to connect his queen and bishop on this line, on this diagonal, All right? So, so he plays and bishop takes e5, okay? So now, um, if the, let's say, let's see what, I mean, Okay, so so here, um, <laughs> of course, Black chose to continue copying, <laughs> but that was a mistake. So um, the best move uh, is probably to accept the pawn loss, take the bishop, take. So now, um, now Black is down a pawn, and no more copying, right? So so that's the best move. But he didn't do that. He chose to continue copying, and now we're going to see what was the punishment. Bishop takes g five. Right, bishop takes g7, continue to copy. Um, bishop takes f8. So now here, what do you think um, black's best move is? To take with the queen to stop the check. Yeah, there's a mate threat right here, <laughs> right? Um, I don't know if this was a fast game or not, um, because I'm sure if it was a slow game, like he would have seen that threat because he didn't take the bishop of course he continued to copy <laughs> so so he just wanted to uh he just wanted to finish out this beautiful game i think this game went down in history as being like the longest uh copycat game this is like six this is 16 moves long <laughs> so they made history maybe that's why he wanted to let him checkmate him on g7 he, they made history <laughs> so yeah this is one example of how to punish the copycat strategy, right? Um, so yeah, very good. All right, so uh, let's look at. I got. I got another. Um, I got another position, another game uh, that's also a copycat game, and it's also a miniature. And this is played. White is Capablanca versus uh, guy NN. Uh, in 1918 in New York. So this is also a copycat game. Imagine imagine being someone, imagine you're playing Jose Raul Capablanca, right? And, and uh, you know you know how powerful of a chess player he is. And, you, and your idea when you play him, you know, you know what? I'm going to copy him. I'm going to copy his moves. <laughs> like, it's just funny that, that somebody chose to do that against a, a world champion, <laughs> thinking that that would outsmart him somehow. <laughs> That's, I mean, I guess it shows some people have uh, guts. <laughs> knight f3, knight c6, knight c3. So we see copy, 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 d3, d6, bishop g5, bishop g4, knight d5, knight d4, queen d2, queen d7. <laughs> All right. So now we're getting to the interesting part. So now bishop takes... Uh, so now, obviously, he can take back because this is going to be a queen fork, right? So he's got to continue copying him. Bishop takes. And now, uh, white to move. What do you think the best move is for white here? Queen to g5. Okay, so queen g5 going in for a mate threat right here. So um, there's a few ways that you can let's see yeah there's, there's two ways i see that you can protect against that you can go queen so black can continue to copy queen g4 right and that would defend against the mate threat um and uh let's say he let's say he takes here oh he can't take all right he's pinned yeah so um so yeah that's one possible way another possible way is um 
um, knight back, right? That attacks the queen and defends g7, right? So another possible way to protect. Um, yeah. All right. So what else? He didn't play queen g5. What's another move? Knight to e7? Yeah, knight to e7. So, so one way that you can, of course, disrupt the copycat strategy is by making uh, a check, right? That's a very good way. Uh, and also in this way, that leads to uh, a pretty quick finish. Knight e7 check. Um, so king h8, what's the next move here? Best move. Bishop to queen h6. Uh, let's see. Queen h6. Ah, that's an interesting move. Um, hmm. Let's see. Um, yeah, so he can't take the bishop because that's going to be mate, right? Uh, so probably he can just protect like this. Rook g8. Now he protects the, the, uh, the g7 pawn um so yeah all right so um i heard okay queen h6 so did did somebody say anything adam you say something bishop to g7 okay so bishop takes g7 so before i before i move the piece can you see it uh what's the follow-up bishop takes g7 king is forced to take back now what does white do queen uh, g5 queen g5 king is forced back to h8 I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did good. You did good. Bishop takes g7. King takes. Queen g5 check. King is forced back now. Oh, queen uh, f6. Queen f6 is mate. Yeah. So, yeah, bishop sacrifice leading to a forced mate in two. So, very nice. Very nice way that the, um, the world champion, I believe he's the third world champion, um, punished this man for trying to copy him. <laughs> I'm sure he never tried to copy, uh, try the copycat strategy with Capo Blanca ever again. <laughs> so this was this game was over in 14 moves. Oh. So yeah, I think he learned his lesson. <laughs> so um, that's uh, yeah. So that's the lessons. Any any uh, any questions for today? Any comments observations what do you guys think of this these games or the first game it was very interesting yeah <laughs> um yeah very uh it's it's nice to see the different uh, di different types of games like the first one very slow syst systematic methodical and then these ones are so quick and they're over right <laughs> um but um but yeah most games are not that quick like these ones and so and so it is very important uh for most for for beginners to learn you know how do you strategize right how do you figure out you know what the position calls for um and what you know what strategy should you employ where should you attack where should you defend you know where should my pieces be you know at their optimal uh location uh, do, do you guys have, do you guys feel like you encounter that problem when you're playing your games that sometimes you don't know what to do in a particular position? Definitely. Yeah. So do yeah. I. <sighs> yeah. I mean, it's something that, uh, you know, the more you play, the more you study, um, you kind of get a, a sense, you know, I guess an intuition of uh, where you should, you should be attacking, where you should be focusing your forces. Um because uh, you know you want to make sure you're you know you're always optimizing your pieces and you're not wasting time by putting your pieces um, on the part of the board where they're not doing anything you know where they're or 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 they could be easily blocked off right so so yeah you know focus your pieces where they should be focused and then open lines to make sure that they have a clear path right to uh, to the opponent 
Um, yeah. Any other comments, questions? When you send out the um, video for tonight, yeah. did, did you include in the email the name of that book that you told us about last week? Yeah. Uh, my system. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Right. Yeah. My system. Yeah. I can do that. Thank you. Um, yeah. That, that's the book. And, and by the way, that book, um, I believe I told you last week also that Tigran Petrosian said that he uh, sleeps with that book. Well, he used to sleep. He's dead now, but <laughs> he used to sleep <laughs> with that book under his pillow. <laughs> maybe um, they buried him with it. Maybe they buried him with it. <laughs> 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 right. Right. Um, so it's very, um, yeah, very valuable book for chess players. Very useful. Uh, Nimzovich contributed a lot to um, to chess uh, insight, chess philosophy. Um, and, I, and I think it also goes to show that, you know, chess is not just about attacking and, you know, wild, brilliant sacrifices, but, you know, it, you have to, you know, you have to know how to plan, you know, you have to have foresight, you have to, you know, figure out how to open lines. You gotta, you gotta like, sometimes you gotta create um, you got to create an attack out of nothing. Like that's, that's one thing that I noticed um, they described Carlson um, as being Magnus Carlson, um, where he's, he's known for like never accepting draws because even in what looks to be a drawn position, um, he, he somehow gains a, a win. And they, they say that he has this ability to squeeze water from stone <laughs> <laughs> because he's so, um, he can just take like the most minute advantage and turn that into a win, uh, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. So, so yeah. Um, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. I thought the, uh, I thought Petrosian was really cool. Really, really interesting um, personality, really interesting approach to chess. Um, I think it teaches students a lot about um you know how you know chess you know it doesn't have to be exciting doesn't meant to have to be brilliant sacrifices but you know he, he achieves the wins nevertheless and and look, look at that he became world champion right so <laughs> i think i think there's a story about bobby fisher that tigran petrosian is so like like the gate like when you're playing him the game is so dull and slow that bobby fisher actually fell asleep <laughs> during, during a game with Tigran and Petrosian. <laughs> so yeah, it's not not you can imagine not so exciting, right? <laughs> um I'm not sure if he Bobby Fisher won. Maybe he still beat him <laughs> even if he fell asleep. <laughs> but um yeah, I thought that was a funny illustration of Petrosian's slow methodical style. So yeah. All right. So that's the uh, that's the lesson for today. So we'll do a similar thing next week. Uh, yeah. like an analysis of a, of a game like this everybody likes yeah. that yeah sounds good cool cool all right well great seeing you all yep. and i will see you guys next week sounds hey. great hope you have a Thank wonderful you. week you Thanks too take have care bye-bye bye-bye thanks bye. for a great class no problem <laughs>